Hello everyone, so this is a re-upload of a previous video that was on the channel that was just taken down a couple of days ago, so this will get a little bit of a different intro, uh, because obviously I want to explain what's going on with not only the greatest series, you know, the greatest title reigns and the greatest rivalries, and I'm wanting to get back into that, but unfortunately, it will not be in the same format that you are used to seeing here on the channel, because... I've tried everything as far as to working with footage with Jam Express companies, specifically <laughs> Devious High, because they seem to be the ones that will love to strike content off of YouTube. Not just claim it, but like take it completely down. And that's exactly what happened with the Kobashi video here that is being re-uploaded. So I get an email yesterday, as you're seeing this, taking it down, and usually... When I get this email, they usually timestamp it with, this is what was used, you know, and I can at least understand where it's coming from, but this was a little bit different. So you see here, this was manually detected, which that's a first for me, because usually it's either from an automatic flag, because, you know, if you use usually clips after about 20 seconds or so, it could get automatically flagged. But, after years of, you know, doing these types of videos and w trying to work around copyright content, usually anything less than 20 seconds is usually good to go. And that was the case with this video, until today, where literally somebody from TVSI was on YouTube, and was like, oh, this guy's using uh, content from Kenta Kobashi vs. Masahiro Chono's match that we aired on TVSI? Yeah, we're taking that down. <laughs> that's that's not happening. Not on our watch. So, that's, um, you know, and, and just throughout the years, I usually have been very, you know, passive about addressing this because it is their footage. I'm totally fine with them uh, having, you know, if they want the footage taken down, that's totally fine. If they don't want to have clips over 20, 30 seconds, that's totally fine. I get that. But this now is just like, all right, now that... You can't even have anything below 20 seconds of clip footage. You have to. You have to just keep on changing with the times. And with this change is now, all right, they don't want us to use footage. We won't use footage. So it's just going to be audio only from here on out. I hate doing that because it feels like it's a step back in production. It's a step back in trying to put the best quality video out there. Because I do like, you know, matching up the footage with my audio as far as talking about the matches, talking about kind of what's going on. Fortunately, that cannot be the case anymore because, well, TV's I are uh, taking matters in their own hands. So, uh, as far as for the foreseeable future, no more footage involving uh, the greatest title reigns videos and the greatest uh, championship reigns, as you've seen here, as far as with Kenko Bashi's. And then, you know, we're going to see the upload, or rather the re-upload of the Kobashi vs. Masao Greatest Rivalry video. So that should be fun to see. Hopefully it still does the trick as far as getting the point across that this is greatness that we saw between, you know, Kenta Kobashi's GHC Everweight title reign and also the rivalry between Kenta Kobashi and Mitsuo Masao. And hopefully in the future now, when I'm able to, now that I think it's going to be audio only, you're going to be seeing a lot more of these. So that's going to be nice as far as trying to look at the positive aspect of this change. In the future, but thank you for clicking on the video. If you just were like, oh, I already saw this, but Sentinax re-uploaded it, I want to, you know, give him another like and another watch. Thank you for that. That is very, very awesome. You guys are doing that, and uh, hopefully, now, like I said, we can do a lot more of these in the future. But uh, yeah, without further ado, here is the audio version of the Kinnikobashi's Jitsi Heavyweight Title Reign. Hopefully, this is as good as the video version of this so just fingers crossed there hopefully you guys will still enjoy it branching out of the greatest rivalry series today we're going to start our journey into discussing what are the greatest championship title reigns in the history of japanese press and of course we have to start with what is in my opinion the greatest championship reign of all time it starts after a burning hammer and ends with a very questionable booking decision lasting for 735 days 15 matches in total and successfully defending his championship 13 times, all against 13 unique opponents, eight of them taking place at Nippon Budokan, and two taking place at the Tokyo Dome. And if you tally up his time in the ring during those 13 title matches, 
He wrestled for over eight hours, and if you want to see all these matches, they are available on YouTube. So have at it. Go on a deep dive. Enjoy what is, in my opinion, the greatest championship reign of all time in the world's of Jeopardy. As far as I think, and just in the greatest championship reign in the history of wrestling in general. But the start of this historical title reign, of course, takes us back to Navigate for Evolution 2003 in a match that I'll be talking about now for a third time in the span of a month here on the channel. And for those of you who have been following along, you already know why this match is epic, and if you haven't, and this is the first thing you've seen from me, I've done an in-depth analysis of this match and, and broke it down more of an in-depth perspective on my Kobashi versus Masao Greatest Rivalry videos. So if you want to have a more in-depth analysis, go check that out. But for those who haven't, here's the cliff notes. Kobashi's burning hammer to win the match puts a stop to a 13-year history between the two men, with Kobashi finally beating Masao in the big-time match, and he had to create the most powerful move in Japanese press history to do it, along with some of the most iconic spots of all time, and like the tiger suplex off the damn ramp to the floor, it's simply incredible. It's a great match. Everybody should see that match. I can't praise it enough. Kendo Kobashi's first defense came just a month after defeating Mitsuhama Sao to become the sixth ever GHC Heavyweight Champion, taking on burning stablemate Timon Honda, a former Olympic wrestler turning into a pro wrestler in 1993 at the age of 30. Masao is on commentary for this one, and Masahiro Chono is there at ringside for this one as well. You will start to see that being a trend of seeing the future opponents of Kobashi shown in the crowd quite often during these matches, during these title defenses. Beginning of the match sees Timon Honda pulling off multiple submission attempts on Kenta Kobashi, quite the stalling brain buster from Kobashi that gets a round of applause from the crowd and gets a two count. Kobashi with a guillotine leg drop to the back of the head on Timon Honda, who's hanging up on the middle rope as a DDT on the ramp from Kenta Kobashi. Timon Honda with an insane transition from a sleeper hold to a German suplex, suplexing Kenta Kobashi from inside the ring onto the ramp. Timon Honda with a cross arm bar that makes Kenta Kobashi looking like he's a fish out of water to get to the ropes and to break it up, and he finally does. Timon Honda continues to work on the taped up arm of Kobashi, running it into the ring post. Timon Honda blocks the sleeper suplex and hits an ace crusher out of nowhere as fucking Diamond Dallas Page here, as Timon Honda goes for an amateur wrestling style backdrop, but Kobashi counts a guillotine choke. That was fucking, that was an MMA spot, is that what that was? As Kobashi hits a gnarly German suplex, followed by a half Nelson suplex. Honda kicks out at two. Middle rope German suplex from Timon Honda. What the fuck? Kenta Kobashi kicks out. Timon Honda goes with a powerbomb. Kobashi counters with a Rana. Gets up and levels Honda with a Laird. And Honda kicks out. Wow. I, you know, I honestly thought that was going to be it. That was a great false finish. We see a great counter to Kobashi's Laird with a spear. Honda falls up with a German suplex. Fighting spirit from Kobashi who hits another Laird. Brilliant stuff there. The crowd's just going nuts at this point. Honda blocks the burning Laird and rolls through for a pin. Kobashi kicks out. What a goddamn sleeper. Suplex from Kobashi. Kobashi hits the burning Laird and that's all she wrote for this one. It's funny to note that the two men became GHC Tag Team Champions a few months after this title match, defeating Jun Akiyama and Akatoshi Saito, two men that we'll be seeing much more later on down the line. As uh, this match is really, really good. It's pretty much there to get Kobashi an easy first defense in theory. But what I love about this is Timon Honda was a career mid-carder. And by the end of the match, you could start believing that the near falls could actually put away Kenta Kobashi. And you believe Timon Honda was a credible contender. That's what a great champion does. And that's what a great championship reign is all about to elevate guys. You need matches like these to make the special matches where it's actually against main event level guys feel even more special. After the match, Kenta Kobashi challenges Masahiro Chono to a title match, and we see Chono coming into the ring, accepting it and cutting a promo, which that leads us to the Tokyo Dome at New Japan's ultimate crush against Masahiro Chono in the second defense in what is Kenta Kobashi's first appearance for a New Japan exclusive show in the only GHC heavyweight title match of Kobashi's reign to have not taken place at a Noah show. Quite the historic match. Having one of the four pillars of all Japan taking on one of the three musketeers of New Japan. The previous year, Masahiro Chono Mitsuhara Masao went to a 30-minute draw at the Tokyo Dome. It's just, I mean, this is what it's about at the end of the day. Like, that was kind of the, the crazy thing about the early 2000s. When Noah formed, you started to see the four pillars taking on the three musketeers. Really, really cool that Noah and New Japan had the idea of doing these four pillars are three musketeers with Chono, Masawa, and Chono, and Kobashi here. 
as uh, the big fight feel for this one is just off the charts. The crowd is jam-packed for this one. This is, you know, it's historic before the bell even rings when you have that type of level of aura about these two men. It's unreal. As the, the first big move of the match is, again, like the last match, the stalling brain buster from Kobashi, DET from Kobashi, superplex from Kobashi. Chono leads Kobashi up to the Tokyo Dome ramp, goes for the powerbomb, Kobashi counters with a backdrop. Kobashi tries to powerbomb Chono on the ramp, and this time Chono's the one who counters with Arana. Chono suplexing Kobashi back into the ring, patting it, machine gun chaps in the corner, five by the spinning chap. Chono with a back suplex on Kobashi, hits another one, and Kobashi lands face and head first. <laughs> Jesus, as he hits a third one, again, another crazy bump from Kobashi, Yakuza kick from Chono. STF from Chono, but Kobashi gets out of it. Half Nelson suplex from Kobashi. Kobashi hits the buckle bomb and hits a, another half Nelson suplex. Chono kicking out of two. A third half Nelson suplex. Kobashi hits another suplex. Tenzan now leaps up to the apron, threatening to throw in the towel for Chono. Kobashi again suplexing Chono. I mean, just, dear God, for a man with a previously broken neck, he's eating all these suplexes. And a fifth one, I believe. A fifth half Nelson suplex in this match. And now, Kobashi... It's got to be it. Burning Lariat. No, Kobashi doesn't pin him. Instead, electing to pick him up in another Burning Lariat. A second Burning Lariat. And that's it. Kenta Kobashi wins it. The story of Kobashi hitting five or six suplexes and two Burning Lariats to finish off Masahiro Chono was a choice. You know, you know going into the finish, it's going to be an overkill for Chono. I mean, when you're going to have a New Japan guy lose to a Noah guy, it's all about politics at the end of the day. And... Even though, sure, could have been one Burning Lariat, or even he kicks out, and maybe a little bit down the line, you have a second one, then he, you know, doesn't kick out of that one. That probably went a lot better, but just kind of the idea of the overkill finish was, uh, you know, I usually overkill finishes to me can kind of come across as drawing out the inevitable. So there's a lot of times I'm just kind of like, all right, let's wrap, let's wrap this son of a bitch up. Like, we already know what's going to happen. There's no way he's kicking out of this, and... Uh, just, uh, it's kind of funny that, um, that's exactly what happened and what I, you know, was thinking going into the match the first time I saw it. I was like, oh, you know, Chono's probably gonna get killed with just about everything, you know, they're gonna throw everything at him in a bunched up sequence, so it's just like he's overkilled, and still a good match, but I just never felt like Chono had a real shot of winning this one throughout the match. When you have, like, the Timon Honda match to this match, I personally think the Timon Honda match is better than this match, which is... Pretty crazy to think about. Obviously, Masahiro Chono, you know, NWA, World Heavyweight Champion, has been at the top of the mountain as far as Japanese press is concerned at that time, you know, for about a decade. And uh, to have me prefer a match to a guy who, you know, became a pro wrestler at 30 years old and has only been doing it for like seven, eight years and has never been at that level just kind of shows you that it doesn't matter your status or your even how big you are as far as your the importance level of a match. At the end of the day, it's all about how you can construct that match to make it better in comparing it to others, especially in this title reign. I just don't see it as a top five match in the reign. But obviously, this is not set in stone. This is all opinion-based thing. So if you have it rated in your top five, or even just you think it's a really good match, or you think it's an awesome match, fair fucks to you. <laughs> it's all, all opinion-based. But it's still a very important match for Japanese press, and I'm very happy this match was happening and it took place during this reign. So there is that. Our next title defense sees our first foreigner take on Kenta Kobashi and the late great Bison Smith on day three of Noah's navigation over the date line in 2003. Bison Smith will be the youngest challenger to face Kenta Kobashi during this title reign. The match starts off much faster compared to the previous Masio Chono match, which makes a lot of sense. You know, this is not at a big Tokyo Dome or they're looking to slow build this one. And especially Bison Smith being the youngest challenger. You know, he's, you know, 30 at the time, while the other two men that we just saw were in their 40s. We see a shot in the god in the crowd, strike exchanges of chops and forearms from both men. Kobashi with his running knees, Russian leg sweep spot, stalling brain buster from Kobashi, Bison Smith with a great flying shoulder tackle that takes Kobashi to the floor, Bison Smith with a crazy flying shoulder block off the top rope to the floor. This man is around 260, 270 pounds at that point. And he's doing this. That's pretty nuts. Bison's not done either. Power bombs Kenta Kobashi on the floor. Bison Smith slams Kobashi through a table over the barricade. Back in the ring, Bison Smith hits a power slam on Kobashi. Bison this time shows his strength, installing Brain Buster on Kobashi. 
Machine gun chops in the corner from Gobashi, spinning chops from Gobashi. We see dueling iron claws from both men as both men locking in their iron claws. As we see Arana off the middle rope from Bison Smith, just the athletic display that Bison Smith has shown this match. It's just been great. What an athlete. As Iron Claw slam off the middle rope from Bison Smith and Kobashi kicking out of two. Half Nelson suplex from Kobashi and Iron Claw STO this time from Bison Smith. That gets a two count. Bison, it's the Bicentennial, which you all know as the South Clash. And that's not enough to even put away Kenta Kobashi. Kobashi paintbrushes Smith with some chops, follows up with a Half Nelson suplex. A third Half Nelson suplex on this match. He's not done though. A fourth one. Oh my god, a fucking fifth one now. Please, for the love of God, finish him, Kobashi. Jesus, and he does just that with the Burning Lariat. As, uh, I hate to speak ill of Bison Smith, because I love that man to death. It's such a shame we lost him at 38 years old. Still so, so young. This would be one of the weaker matches of the reign. Uh, by all means, still a good match. But it being the shortest match during the reign, and I simply just think Bison just wasn't ready for this type of spot in my opinion against Kendo Kobashi here had this have happened a couple of years later I think he could have killed it if it's it just didn't reach the level of what other matches reached during this reign I really think the back-to-back -back overkill finishes too with the you know you have five half Nelson suplexes four back to back to back to back and then having a burning lariat where in the previous match you had five to six and another you know two burning lariats does get a bit redundant, in my opinion, but that's, again, that's me not really being a fan of the overkill type of finish. Especially with Bison Smith. God bless him, but he was just not at that level where I think it was necessary to do that. As our next match takes place at the Palm Budokan at Noah's Navigation over the Dateline 2003. For the first time, Kenta Kobashi defends his GHC heavyweight title for the second time during the same tour. So he takes on another New Japan faithful. And Yuji Nagata. Blue Justice versus Orange Crush. This is going to be awesome. We got some chops and punches in the corner from Kobashi. Nagata runs through a chop and hits a Yakuza kick. Jun Akiyama's on commentary for this match too. It wouldn't be a Kobashi JC title match without a stalling brain buster. Nagata kicks out of it at two. Nagata chops down Kobashi with some leg kicks. Then floors him with a Yakuza kick that sends him onto the ramp. An awesome spot of Nagata sending Kobashi off the ropes and then hitting an overhead belly to belly suplex on the damn ramp. Kobashi now just chopping the shit out of Nagata. Both men start trading shots. Nagata winning out in the strike exchange and then locking in a Nagata lock on Kobashi who gets to the ropes. Right after getting to the ropes, Nagata with an arm bar which Kobashi gets out of to the ropes again. Machine gun chops in the corner from Kobashi. Nagata targeting the arm of Kobashi with some kicks to the arm. Nagata with another Nagata lock, just really smart ring psychology from Yuji Nagata, targeting that arm and using kicks to that same arm and using Nagata locks and arm bars and submission holds throughout the match. Just really, really smart psychology. What a sequence here. Seeing both men going tick for tack with suplexes, exploders, and strikes. Just unreal. Kobashi hits his running knees, but doesn't go for the rushing leg sweep spot. Instead, hits a spinning chop and then sells the arm. It's a couple of knees from Nagata. What a fucking King's Road style back suplex. Just head first goes Kenta Kobashi. Right after the kick out, Nagata with a cross face on Kobashi who gets to the ropes. Body kicks from Nagata in the corner. Half Nelson suplex from Kobashi. Buckle bomb from Kobashi into another half Nelson suplex. Pinning Yuji Nagata who kicks out. A third half Nelson suplex from Kobashi who just crawls to try to make another cover. He finally gets there. Nagata kicking out of two. Sleeper suplex from Kobashi. Pins Nagata again. This time though he gets his foot on the ropes. What a fucking spin kick from Nagata as Kobashi's charging at him. A fucking exploder off the top rope when Yuji Nagata gets a two count. It takes five enziguris. The fifth one is finally the one to drop Kobashi down just to a knee. Followed by a tremendous back suplex that Kobashi kicks out of. Just holy shit. That crowd was rocking for that sequence in this match. Nagata with a Yakuza kick. Kobashi lays him out with a lariat. Nagata head kicks Kobashi and pins him afterwards. Kobashi kicking out of two. Kobashi counters the Irish whip attempt and lariats Nagata. Now that's a fucking brain buster. <laughs> Dear God. Right to the fucking mad head first. And again, Yuji Nagata is kicking out in a burning lariat. For Kenta Kobashi, and that's all she wrote. My god. Uh, holy shit, that match is awesome. This is pretty much prime Yuji Nagata. He's just, you know, the best. You have Kenta Kobashi at the height of his powers here during this GHC title reign. Just some really great stuff. Truly an awesome match. I would definitely say this is in the top five of the Kobashi's uh, GHC title reign matches. That ending sequence is just incredible. 
as Kobashi's next defense would be against Mitsuha Masawa's longtime partner, the Rat Boy, Yoshinari Ogawa, at Noah's navigation against the current 2003 in the Palm Budokan, as you will be seeing shortly. Ogawa's nickname is quite fitting, if you've never seen a Yoshinari Ogawa match. Ogawa wastes no time to jump on Kobashi, who quickly recovers and chops the shit out of him. Another match with Junakiyama's on commentary for Ogawa and Kobashi doing some chain wrestling with Ogawa, winning out on that exchange. Ogawa leaps onto Kobashi's back, trying to get a sleeper, but Kobashi runs him into the corner as some chops to Ogawa in the corner. Ogawa throws Kobashi's legs into the post. Kobashi missed about a year and a half due to knee injuries in the recent years before this run. He had to change his entire style of wrestling because of it, so when Ogawa's targeting Kobashi's legs and, the, and is throwing him into the ring post and taking down the knee pads and going at it, just uh, the crowd very much shits on Ogawa for it. After he does it, it's awesome. It's very much cheapy. Ogawa hits a dragon screw leg whip and a single leg Boston grab to work on the legs even more. Ogawa now doing a figure four leg lock around the ring post. Ogawa just being a disrespectful little shit to Kobashi in the corner. As he's pissed off the wrong man. No, as he gets lariat afterwards. Ogawa sending Kobashi into the ref. Forcing a ref bump. He falls up with an enziguri to the back of the head. And then hits a back suplex. While the ref is down, the rat boy will cheat. He gets the ring bell. Hits it, Kobashi's legs with it a couple times. Then wraps it around the ring post. And then rams the ring bell into his legs. Kobashi is now pissed. He's fucking fed up with Ogawa, this little shithead. Hits the spinning chop. Sending Ogawa face first in the post, which just leads to Yoshinori Ogawa being a bloody fucking mess. Kobashi then proceeds to just keep rifling off punches to open up that wound even more throughout the match. Really showing off how light Ogawa is, and he hits a delayed jumping back suplex. Machine gun chops in the corner. Ogawa with a roll up, gets his feet on the ropes. Kobashi kicks out. Ogawa goes for the crucifix, but Kobashi counts a lariat and then hits a burning lariat for the win. I would always recommend this to newer fans of Japanese Pro Wrestling who are just trying to get into the product from watching WWE stuff just because Yoshinori Ogawa is playing identifiable chicken shit heel. It's an easy story to tell and follow along, especially for a newer fan. You can kind of understand the characters of both guys and they both play their parts to perfection. It's just very easy for a newer fan. Is it what Japanese Pro Wrestling should be about? Oh god, no. You know, Ogawa was given far too high of a spot. He should have stayed as like a mid-carter, tag-level junior guy, but not in a high-profile heavyweight title match like this one. But that's what happens, though, when you're tag partners with the boss. This should be Kid Nikobashi's last defense in 2003. His first defense in 2004 comes from the first navigation of the year, taking on Takuma Sano, better known as Nuuki Sano, at the World Hall in Kobe. I always thought it was weird that when he joined Pro Wrestling Noe, he became Takuma Sano. By that point, he had been in the business for about almost 20 years. It's not like New Japan had a trademark on his name or anything. Nuuki Sano was a junior heavyweight pioneer with his matches with Liger in the late 80s, early 90s, and I respect him for that. But at this time, he was close to a 20-year vet who had adopted to his roots of more of a UWFI shooter approach. As Sano with a soul butt into a German suplex that sends Kobashi to the floor. Sano teasing a jumping off the buckle to the floor spot only hit a lackluster strike off the apron to the floor. Then it's a quick and fluid drop kick off the top rope back into the ring. That was nicely done though. The two men trade headbutts with Kobashi getting the best of it. Sano then hits a couple of leg kicks. Kobashi, Kobashi lifts up the mat at ringside and DET Sano onto the exposed floor. Then it's a delayed vertical suplex inside the ring. Locks in an SDF gets to the ropes. Sano tries to chop down Kobashi with kicks and then takes him down with drop kicks to the leg. Sano gets on the ankle lock, which Kobashi gets to the ropes. Single leg crab from Sano, and again, Kobashi getting to the ropes to break it up. We had a couple more leg kicks followed by a dragon screw leg whip. Sano then locks in a figure for a leg lock, and Kobashi gets out of that as well. A suicide dive from Sano sends Kobashi into the barricade. A brain buster on the floor from Sano, then falls up with a diving foot stomp off the top rope to the floor. Sano with a diving foot stomp, this time though, in the ring, but doesn't bend Kobashi as the ref's trying to keep Sano off him, but then Sano just throws him into the corner. Soul butt into a brain buster, the ref counts this time around, and Kobashi kicks out at two. Kapo kick into a dragon suplex from Sano, and again Kobashi kicking out half Nelson suplex from Kobashi, a second one. This time Kobashi pins him and Sano kicks out. Shack exchange ends with a lariat from Kobashi, pins Sano again, who kicks out again. Then we have a fucking deadly brain buster, what a brain buster here from Kobashi. And that's it, rightfully fucking so, he does not need the burning lariat to beat Sano. So this match is, in my opinion, the worst match of the reign. Not memorable at all. And the crowd couldn't give a shit about Tukumasano here. 
as I uh, couldn't do anything that really put Kobashi in danger. I get having guys like Timon Honda, like Bison Smith getting title shots to help beef up the reign. Even though they don't have a, an actual prayer in, in beating Kendo Kobashi going into it, it helps to make the other matches feel special and mean more. But going out of those two matches, there was a time where you actually believed that they had a legitimate chance of beating him. Sano, on the other hand, had no chance. Should be nowhere near the GHC heavyweight title picture, even less than Ogawa. That's how much Sano shouldn't be near the title picture at the time, and really at all, to be honest. And having those title matches back-to-back -back was not a great idea. But that's what makes the greatness of Kenta Kobashi. His talent elevates guys and even makes believable moments of matches against fuckers who really have no business in the title match to begin with. But I'm happy that didn't even need to hit a burning lair to put Sano away. Didn't have to hit any of Kendo Kobashi's next title defense would be against former sumo wrestler and one of his protégés, Takeshi Rikio, who was a burning stable mate of his. He is Kendo Kobashi's most inexperienced opponent in the entire reign. Before the bell rings, Rikio charges at Kobashi. He then sumo chops him into the corner. A piss poor layered into a body splash from Rikio that gets a two count. Rikio rains down some forms on Kobashi when he's down. They go onto the ramp, Kobashi chopping the shit out of him. Kobashi then with a delayed rain buster and pins Rikio who kicks out at two. They do a chop exchange, which Kobashi wins out on. Riki with a drop kick to the knees of Kinta Kobashi, and dear God, I mean, Kobashi's knees buckle so bad here. I'm shocked, especially with Kobashi's knee problems. It didn't really mess him up. Like, that was crazy. That did not look good at all. As Rikio continued to work on the leg with a splash of figure four leg lock on him. As Rikio keeps the pressure on Kento Kobashi's leg some more with a scorpion death lock. Kobashi firing back with headbutts. Rikio answers with some of his own. Winning out on the exchange, Rikio practically runs through Kobashi in the corner. Gives Kobashi the taste of his own medicine with a buckle bomb. Splash off the top rope. Kinto Kobashi kicks out. Half Nelson suplex. A very good Laird from Rikio here. Power bomb with a stacked pin. Kinto Kobashi again kicking out. We get a fucking jackhammer from Takeshi Rikio. And again, that's not enough to put away Kinto Kobashi. Rikio goes for the power bomb. Kinto Kobashi counters. Half Nelson suplex. Fighting spear from Takeshi Rikio. Tries to Laird Kobashi who just floors him with a spinning chop instead. And we get a burning Lariat, and that's all she wrote for Takeshi Rikio. Good match on the scale of the rain, though. It's definitely towards the average side, but that's pretty much due to, I would say, Takeshi Rikio's lack of really name value and inexperience at this point. More than anything, Kabashi gave him a lot of offense, though. But the crowd just never really cared and really gave a shit about it. Unless Kinda Kobashi was the one on offense, it's when they were up in arms about it, but really, I don't think it was going to be at the level of what it could have been. Takeshi Rikio just wasn't ready for this one to be a good or great match. Kendo Kobashi gets his biggest challenger in stature yet in Yoshihiro Takayama, the only man to be all of the big three's heavyweight and tag team champions, as well as an NWF heavyweight champion and an all-Asia tag team champion. Yoshihiro Takayama is two years past his incredible and infamous fight at Pride 21 against Don Fry, which pretty much cemented himself as a top caliber main event level draw. On paper, this is Kobashi's biggest test yet as a GHC heavyweight champion, a legitimate fighter who towers over him. Kobashi just about decapitates Takayama with a spinning chop in the corner. PK kick from Takayama. They have a strike exchange, a chop exchange, with Kinta Kobashi coming out on the winning end. Takayama goes for a backdrop, but Kobashi counters with a headlock takeover. Knee in the corner into a butterfly suplex from Takayama. Very smooth takedown out in the corner from Takayama. Followed by leg kicks as Takayama goes for the PK again. This time, though, Kobashi catches and then attempts to take down the California Redwood of the Japanese Pro Wrestling World and Yoshi or Takayama with chops, but it's unsuccessful. What a great simple spot here of Yoshima Takayama going for the cross on bar, fighting for it on Kobashi for just about 20 seconds, and the crowd just ooing and aahing to see if Kobashi will get to the rope or if Takayama would lock it in. King's Road style suplex and dear god sends Kendo Kobashi head first into the mat. Everest German suplex from Takayama. Kobashi kicks out it to the crowd chanting Kobashi as Takayama drop kicks Kobashi in the corner, then hits a running knee. Takayama gets caught in the ropes after missing with the Yakuza kick. Kobashi hits some spinning chops and hits a half Nelson suplex. Dragon suplex from Takayama. Doesn't keep the bridge though. Goes for a simple cover and Kobashi kicks out. Running knee from Takayama again. Goes for it again. This time though, Kobashi clobbers in with a lariat. They get back up. Takayama some leg kicks and rocks Kinta Kobashi. 
What a fucking brain buster from Kento Kobashi to do a brain buster on a man that's 6'5". Insane. Takeyama kicks out. For the first time in this defense, Kobashi looks for the burning hammer. But Takeyama stops it. Body slam from Kobashi. The crowd erupts. They know what's fucking coming. Moonsault off the top row for the first time in this GHC title ring during a defense. Right to the fucking face, no less. And that's all she wrote. Kinda Kobashi is your winner. Such a fantastic match. An absolute banger. These two men are so awesome. And to have this epic encounter during this reign was such a delight. Shocking to think that four months after this match happens, Yoshiro Takayama would suffer a stroke after a block match at the G1 Climax. This match between Kobashi and Takayama is unreal. Wildly enough, it somehow gets even better than this. In our next title match, taking place at Noah Departure, Live on pay-per-view from the Tokyo Dome, it's the conclusion of Sternness vs. Burning, and the two leaders going to war for the GHC Heavyweight title. Jun Akiyama looks to beat the man who he had faced in his pro wrestling debut on September 17th, 1992, Kenta Kobashi on the biggest stage. Kobashi with some chops to Akiyama who's on the ropes. What a tremendous counter from Akiyama who counters the Russian leg sweep after the knees with a leg sweep into a leg bar. Fantastic stuff there. What a fucking overhead shot from Kobashi. Would have killed a mortal man, but instead Akiyama kicks out it too. Another strike exchange that results in Kobashi chopping the shit out of Akiyama, turning his chest bright red. What a counter from Akiyama hitting a jumping knee as Kobashi's going for the flying shoulder block. DDT on the apron from Jun Akiyama. Akiyama the diving knee off the top rope to a hanging off the apron Kobashi. Guillotine choke from Jun Akiyama. Kobashi managing the power of his head out of the grip. Double arm DDT from Akiyama. Falls up the flying form to the back of the neck off the top rope. Akiyama again locks in the guillotine choke. But this time though, Kobashi rolling himself and Akiyama to the ropes. Back suplex from Akiyama. Sleeper suplex from Kobashi. Machine gun chops in the corner from Kobashi. And dear God in heaven. Suplex off the apron to the fucking floor. That's a Tokyo Dome bump right there. Half Nelson suplex from Kobashi and for the first time in this title defense in the GHC heavyweight title reign. Orange fucking crush. Akiyama kicks out. Laird from Kobashi. Akiyama kicks out. Akiyama escapes instant death getting out of the burning hammer and hits a German suplex. Falls over the running knee. Oh fuck. An exploder off the turnbuckle to the floor. Jesus Christ, my god, he's not even done. Junakiyama, exploder off the top rope back into the ring now, and Kobashi kicking out a third time. Junakiyama with a guillotine choke against Kobashi, who gets out. A wrist clutch exploder from Junakiyama, and that's not enough to put away Kenta Kobashi. Oh, fucking Christ, a disgusting brain buster from Kobashi. Doesn't even have the strength to cover him, just murders him with it and has to lay there and hope to find something that can finish him off later on. Have Nelson suplex from Kobashi, fighting spear from Akiyama, exploder, fighting spear from Kobashi, both men just trading suplexes, then they start trading shots, burning Laird from Kobashi, and for the first time in this defense, somebody kicks out of it. Unreal. Moonsault from Kobashi, Akiyama against kicked out, so now we've had burning Lariat. It's kicked out by Akiyama, Akiyama kicks out of the moonsault. This is unreal. Kobashi though. Hits the burning hammer like he did in their 2000 match. And you all know nobody's kicking out of that. Your winner, Kenta Kobashi. It's the second best match of the reign for sure. It's behind the Masao match in my opinion. But if Akiyama would have beat him here, I actually would have put that match first. I'm not much of a star reviewer guy. But I completely understand why someone would rate something like 4.75 stars out of 5. After seeing this match for the first time, due to who won this match, I couldn't say it was perfect. This match is the longest match of Kendo Kobashi's GHC Heavyweight title reign, but in my opinion, it's the biggest mistake I can think of when thinking of Prime Noah. This was set up perfectly for Kobashi to lose to Jun Akiyama. The story is incredible between these two men. Why Masawa didn't see this and thought this would have been the perfect way to end the title reign, I'll never know. Because you know he pretty much now has killed off anybody logically to beat Kendo Kobashi and have it not just be a complete letdown. To what this could have been. If the reign ends here. It's still one of the greatest championship reigns of all time. Eight defenses at 497 days. With the completion of the story rivalry. Of Jun Akiyama and Kenta Kobashi. But no. We keep on trucking. With Kenta Kobashi's GHC Heavyweight Champion. Masawa thought Jun wasn't really a draw. 
for processing no at the time, which is hilarious, given that he may have been a January 4th Tokyo Dome show in front of 51,000 people. Two years previous, granted, it was a pretty god-awful car, but that's not to Jun Akiyama and Yuji Nagata's far. That they were the highlights of the show. He probably could have been a bigger draw, too, for Noah had Mitsuharu Masao not have Akiyama lose in four minutes to Yoshinori Ogawa, of all fucking people, out of nowhere to end his first GHC heavyweight title reign. The title reign, even though I disagree with the decision, continues on to Nippon Budokan against fellow Four Pillars member Akira Taue, and Noah navigation over the dateline, no matter what Akira Taue was doing, at this time, and really throughout his career, when the man is given a main event spot, he would bring his A game. Always he would. I mean, he's phenomenal talent. Now, did he deserve this title shot, though? I would say no. He gets the title shot after a 30-minute draw between him and Masawa. Masawa's just basically throwing whoever the fuck he can at Kobashi at this point. After the match with Akiyama, it starts to be clear that there's really no true definitive reason for a lot of these challengers. Chop exchange from both men. Taui comes out on the winning end, hits an enziguri. Overhead chops in the corner from Taui. What a kick from Taui. Falls up the dragon screw leg whip. STF from Taui. Taui keeps the pressure on the legs with a knee breaker. There's a guillotine choke. This time, though, from Kobashi. No doubt Otashi on the ramp from Akira Taui. Yakuza kick in the corner from Taui into a German suplex, followed by a second German suplex. Or got Taui off the apron to the fucking floor, dear God. Taui with a sit-out powerbomb. Kobashi kicks out. Kobashi now is the one who hits the Nodao Otashi on Taui. Oh shit, Kobashi missing the moonsault. Taui with a Nodao Otashi into the Orage Taui. Kobashi looking for the powerbomb. Taui counters, though, into a Rana. Chichibu cement from Akira Taui. Kobashi somehow kicks out of that as well. Top rope splash from Taui, and again Again, Kobashi kicking out, half Nelson suplex from Kobashi, spinning chops from Kobashi in the corner, burning Larry, and Taui kicks out of a burning Larry to add another man to the list. Kobashi must break out for the first and only time in this reign, the wrist clutch burning hammer, and gets the win with it. The thing I love about this title match against Takira Taui is how he took what guys like Takayama did, who used his size. He did what Nagata did, working on submissions and kicks to the arm, working on the arm throughout the match, and he did what others did, working on Kobashi's legs. Combine that all to try and take out Kenta Kobashi, and he still came up short. But a very, very good game plan, though. It's crazy how the previous four title matches have also have now come from either the Tokyo Dome or Nippon Budokan. As our next title match takes place at Noah's Navigation against the current, Kenta Kobashi would take on Akatoshi Saito, another career mid-carder, who at the time, his only accolade was being a GHC Tag Team Champion with Sternus leader Jun Akiyama. He would later go on to hold it five more times, but after Sternus broke up post-Kobashi Akiyama, Akatoshi Saida would form Dark Agents. It's not like he's untalented or anything, because one, I think he's given the chance. He can usually put on a good performance, given his offense is pretty solid. He can usually put together an exciting finishing sequence too, but why he got this title match, I'm not really sure. Again, I think Masawa just wanted to make Saito... Just a credible threat with him leading a new faction wanting to make Dark Agents look strong. As Kobashi paintbrushing Saito with chops, spinning chops from Kobashi and somehow doesn't even phase. Saito who just dumps Kobashi with a back suplex. Strike exchange from both men, chops from Kobashi, leg kicks from Saito. And Saito actually wins out on the strike exchange and they end up trading headbutts now. Saito throws Kobashi's legs into the ring post, slingshot to pay from Kobashi to the floor. DT on the ramp from Kobashi, back into the ring, and STF from Kobashi. Knees off the ropes. Instead of the Russian leg sweep, though, Kobashi pulls Saito down and to an overhead chop to the chest as Saito kicks out of that at two. Just instant death is the best way to describe this spot here. Akatoshi Saito brain busters Kobashi off the apron directly to the floor. Dear God. It's amazing he didn't land head and neck first and become paralyzed or even died. It's... That could have went wrong so many ways. Saito starts targeting the arm of Kobashi now, locks in the cross arm bar, which then Kobashi gets to the ropes. Saito then with a death cloak on the ramp. Kobashi blocks a spinning wheel kick and hits a falling lariat onto Saito. Machine gun chops in the corner from Kobashi. Saito with a running leg lariat covers. Kobashi kicks out of two. What a fucking German suplex here. Just instant death for poor Kento Kobashi. That's twice in this match. He's practically died. Parabon with a stack pin, Kobashi kicks out, half Nelson suplex from Kobashi, jumping in Ziguri from Saito, covers Kobashi kicks out, Kobashi with some more half Nelson suplexes, 
Another leg layered from Akatoshi Saito. Multiple spinning chops from Kobashi in the corner. Burning layered from Kobashi. And even Akatoshi Saito's kicking out of the burning layered. God damn. As immediately afterwards, though, he just gets planted with an instant death of a brain buster. And that is all she wrote here. This match has a lot in common with the Timon Honda match in that no one expects Akatoshi Saito to have such a good chance of beating Kinta Kobashi, but he uses these incredible moments like that nasty German suplex or that fucking outrageous brain buster that sends Kobashi to the floor off the apron. That gives him a legit chance of beating him, and the final defense for Kinta Kobashi in the year 2004 comes against his second and final foreigner and another man who has gone far too soon. Mike Awesome, being billed as the gladiator, a navigation uprising spirit. Now, something very important happens during this tour. On days 9 and 10 of this 12-day tour, there's a two-day tag tournament. The finals happen to see Kenta Kobashi and Kenta face Noemichi Marufuji and Takeshi Rikio. With Takeshi Rikio pinning the GHC Heavyweight Champion Kenta Kobashi to win the tournament for his team. Now you would have thought, wow, Takeshi Rikio would have been getting another title shot with Kenta Kobashi. Well, they've been far too late in the tour to make the GHC Heavyweight title match happen, so no on that. They don't face Masao and Ogawa, who were the GHC Tag Team Champions at the time. Instead, Donovan Morgan and Michael Modest face them, and they're a team who weren't even in the fucking two-day tag tournament. How convoluted is that? Why they had, instead, Marufuji Rikio team with Kenta in a six-man tag to end out the tour. And they never even get a tag title shot in the future. Just some real questionable head-scratching booking. All the tried and build up to Keshi Rikio, but really not going full tilt with it. I, I just, it's a real, real head-scratching decision. Mike Awesome got this title shot pretty much because the show takes place in Yokohama, which was a hotbed for FMW. Does that make for a great reasoning behind giving someone a title match? No. Not really. <laughs> not at all. But going into what is the fence number 12 now... There really hasn't been a great excuse for a challenger, like I said, since Junakiyama. Symbolo start with drop downs and ducking of flows lines, which ends up with a crossbody from Kobashi and a layered from Awesome. Kobashi does the same running knees into the overhead chop spot that he did against Saito. Minoru Suzuki looking like a fucking Yakuza boss at ringside there with some elite level drip. So far, the quick shot of him has been the best thing during this entire match so far. Kobashi with a Russian leg sweep to the floor. Awesome with a back suplex to the floor. Mike Awesome now with a tope. Mike Awesome with a slingshot body splash back into the ring. That gets a two count. Mike Awesome setting up a table at ringside. That didn't take long to be used. Mike Awesome with an awesome bomb off the apron to the floor through the table on Kobashi. Butterfly suplex from Awesome. Kobashi kicking out at two. Flying clothesline off the top rope from Mike Awesome. Slingshot tope from Kobashi to the floor. Machine gun chops in the corner from Kobashi. What a goddamn suplex from Mike Awesome. Kobashi looks like he got shot out of a fucking cannon. He's German suplexing a man. 250 pounds and throws him like he's 100 pounds. Unreal. Awesome follows it up with a spear. Awesome dives out of the ring and onto Kobashi who's on the ramp. Mike gets an awesome bomb from the ramp into the ring and it's a top rope splash and Kobashi still kicks out at two. Sit out awesome bomb and again Kobashi kicking out. Oh, fucking awesome bomb off the top rope. Jesus Christ, it takes a little bit for Awesome to cover him to protect the move, obviously, because you know the kickout's coming. Half Nelson suplex from Kobashi into a lariat. Kobashi chops to the neck and then into a half Nelson suplex. For the first time during this reign, a rolling fireman's carry slam for Kobashi. That is no easy feat, too. Mike Awesome, pretty big dude. Burning lariat for Kobashi and add another one to the list. Mike Awesome kicks out. Moonsault off the top from Kobashi puts away Mike Awesome. Being a fan of both guys, I enjoyed the match, but I will say this, this match could have easily been improved if they just cut off five to eight minutes of it. Now, no GHC title match of uh, Kobashi's reign would go less than 25 minutes, so it's kind of the standard of what the title represents, 25-35 minute matches. You could have trimmed that down a lot, and I think it would have looked so much better and would have felt like a more cohesive match. Just kind of felt like they shit-canned like, the last four or five minutes of it and, and just kind of really put together... The finishing touches on something, but it, you can't polish a turd. <laughs> As uh, post match, we see a confrontation from Minoru Suzuki who gets in Kobashi's face on the apron. Oh, fuck yes. Which leads us to our next title match. Kicking off the year 2005, we're back in the Pong Budokan for this one at Noah's Great Voyage. Kenta Kobashi looking to defend his championship against one of the founders of Pancrase, Minoru Suzuki who had become a true latest wonder, as almost 15 years later, he would still be killing in pro wrestling matches, but here, 
He's about 215 matches into his career at this point. And now he's at about, you know, 2,000 now. He's so fast here. Like, a much different type of feel of this match. Kobashi's ready to lock up, and he's just trying to hunt down Suzuki, who's using his skill and quickness and just being a cocky little shithead. It's just some fantastic stuff. If you really love Minoru Suzuki, really go back and watch a lot of his early 2000s stuff, because he is just, he has such an awesome character of knowing he's awesome, knowing he's so talented, and he uses his speed and skill to just outwit a lot of guys in the beginning sequences. Just a lot of fun stuff. Suzuki transitions a triangle choke into an armbar. Some fun stuff there. It's very clear that Kobashi's in some deep, deep waters against a grappling machine. Machine gun chops from Kobashi. Kobashi sets Suzuki onto the buckle, goes for the chop, but Suzuki catches it and hits his now patented hanging rope arm bar. Suzuki works on the arm of Kobashi. They trade palm strikes for a bit before Suzuki does a seated arm bar. Combinations from Suzuki all until Kobashi snags him into a sleeper suplex. Gotch style pile driver from Suzuki. Suzuki with an octopus stretch. Kobashi falls into the ropes to get out of it. Kobashi tries for his old power bomb into the jackknife pin combo but Suzuki blocks it pin with a cross arm bar. Side suplex from Kobashi. Kobashi with another side suplex. A third one from Kobashi and then a fourth one. Burning layered from Kobashi. Bashi, and that's fucking it. That's such a mind-boggling decision there, really, in hindsight. You had Akatoshi Saito kick out of a burning laird, but Minoru fucking Suzuki, father of Pancrase, a legit shooter, like, is going to be a future GHC heavyweight champion, future All Japan Triple Crown champion, like, he's the man, like, why do you not have him kick out of shit and build him up? Made no sense at all, and, uh, it's really, really head-scratching there. I love the match, though. Suzuki's speed is, again, unreal. Like, he is so fast here, and it's just crazy. Yeah, obviously now, like, watching his stuff in 2021, he could sometimes bust out that speed. Usually it's in spurts, but, like... Here, I mean, he's fucking lightning fast compared to what he is now. Just sadly what comes with age. It's you, you lose your, your speed. You lose your little bit of burst to you. And sadly, this GHC Everway title reign is coming to an end. Four days and two years since his historic reign began, defeating Mitsu Amasawa in just one day after his one-year defeat of Takeshi Rikio. Takeshi Rikio gets his rematch, donning some red trunks and a new feather coat, to really give it away, what's about to happen. I'm not even going to go in-depth on this match. With it being the worst of the two Takeshi Rikio matches. And well, you all know what happens. The new, quickly repackaged Takeshi Rikio beats his mentor. To end out Kobashi's incredible GHC heavyweight title reign at two years. If there's ever been a more fumbled push to the main event in Japanese pro wrestling. It's gotta be Takeshi Rikio here. A year after losing to Kobashi, being the young stable made mid-carder to before the end of the year, four months before this title match happens, he beats Kobashi in the finals of that two-day tag tournament. Why they didn't have him and Marfuji get a tag title shot, then have Rikio pin Masawa to become the tag champs, then have him going through some big names and tag title matches for the next couple months into this title match, and even adding some more moves into his arsenal to add to the fact that this is not the same Takeshi Rikio that he faced a year prior, turning this man into an unstoppable force. But instead, we see the tournament and pinfall over his mentor as an afterthought. To really add to this, could have just been Jun Akiyama, you come full circle, he finally beats Kobashi on the big stage to end his GHC Everweight title match, being the first time he beats him for a championship too. Instead, we get a sad attempt of Pro Wrestling Noah trying to make a star. As a booker, you need to know two things. Just two simple things when booking a championship reign. Who's going to be the champion, and how are you going to book the person who's beating the champion before the change happens? The Keshi Rikio was really in a class of four young Pro Wrestling Noah stars. Takeshi Morishima's partner, who was also in Wild 2 with him, Naomichi Fuji, and Kenta. All three would have been much better options in hindsight. Really, at the time, Kenta and Marufuji were for sure talented enough, but they were only shown as junior aces and still the future. Morishima was still not that level yet in 2005, but he would go on to become a multiple-time GHC heavyweight champion. Would it have worked out with those guys? 
I'm not really sure, to be honest. Personally, I think Kent, if he would have done it, I've done it in TW before, Kenta being the guy to stop Kenta Kobashi's title reign, then have Morafuji beat Kenta, and then have Morishima beat Morafuji, to really just focus on the future of Noah. Since I love Kenta, and with the protege angle, but a whole new level, they fucking share the same name, and thought Kenta was incredible, obviously, and it felt like when they finally gave Kenta the GHC Heavyweight Championship, he was not the same Kenta that he was back before in the previous years in the mid and late 2000s when he was shit and piss trunks kenta i mean just imagine how incredible shit and piss trunks fucking heavyweight champion kenta could have been but i don't i just don't think the world was ready though he was still very very small like you kind of see it in the ogawa match with kenta kobashi just from a mere size advantage kenta kobashi has over a lot of those guys i mean he's just a hoss and a half during this reign he's probably 250 260 just an absolute unit barrel chested heavyweight guy so to have a skinny scrawny 170 pound kenta beat him psychology wise it probably wouldn't have made a lot of sense in my opinion the truly the best and only justifiable realistic option was jun akiyama beating kenta kobashi to end out the reign that was it that should have been it, and it was not it. In the end, I just feel really sad for Takeshi Rikio. Here's a man who was thrown into an impossible situation. Rikio's title reign never really gets off the ground. He has a pretty forgettable mid-card GHC Heavyweight title match against Hiroshi Tanahashi at Noah's biggest and best stage, Noah Destiny 2005. He receives an arm injury during his reign, which would be with him for the rest of his career. He lost the belt to Akira Tawe after a three-defense 245 day reign as champion. The company never takes a chance on him again. He retires in 2011. Does this reign hinder off of this poor booking decision? Realistically, yes. But the focus and the reason why it's great and why I think it's the best and greatest championship reign in Japanese pro wrestling history, it's because it shows how great and how amazing of a professional wrestler Kinta Kobashi is. I don't think any championship reign has that many truly great all-time matches, and has 14 unique opponents in it, like Kenta Kobashi's GHC Heavyweight title reign. It's a championship reign that has incredible highs. Kobashi's charisma, skill, and connection with the crowd made bad matches okay, okay matches good, good matches great, and great matches legendary. And in the end, and close to 20 years later in Japanese Pro Wrestling, I still think it's the greatest championship reign of all time, and we've seen some great ones in this 20 years. I hope you all enjoyed this journey into this truly historic title reign, and I will catch you guys next time. Rather, it's in our next journey into the greatest championship title reign or the greatest rivalries. Who knows? We'll see you there. Take care, everyone.